The future series and that series that we've embarked upon lately has been by design. Regarding the age and the time in which we are living, uh, we interrupted our normal teaching. Normally we go through a, a book of the Bible, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and the whole thing behind the future series is to get you acquainted with the fact that the God of the Bible is the one and only who knows the future in advance. It's a great way of saying it, future in advance. The study of that in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation is known as eschatology. Eschatology is God's doctrine given in the Bible that speaks about the future, future events of the Bible. And as you well know by now, 27%, some say 31%, of the Bible is future in its nature. So over a quarter of your scriptures uh, speak about the future. And we're gonna be looking at that today and specifically how it applies to our lives because we are living in the here and now, obviously. The fact that you and I are living in the 21st century has not escaped the God of the Bible and that what is coming up, no matter what that might be, God knows. And that brings us great Great comfort. So with that, church, let's do stand. We're going to go from the screens uh, because we're going to go through some selected passages rather than a chunk of scripture. And um, we're looking at a message today titled Approaching. Approaching. What does that mean? And, and is, is such a theme or thought found in the Bible? And the answer to that is, oh, yes, it is. And we're going to be looking at that. But why is God's word prophetic? And what does it mean in our lives? So first of all, because it's kind of divided up, I'm going to read Isaiah 42, verse 9, and then uh, we'll pick it up in the next section together, but I'll do the opening verse, and uh, in a, two of these passages, you'll pick up in your reading as well as a congregation. From the screens, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, Isaiah says, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they speak or spring forth, I tell you of them. Isaiah 45, 21 says, declare what is to be, present it. Let them take counsel together. Who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I, the Lord? And there is no God apart from me, a righteous God and Savior. There is none but me. Verse 22, church. Isaiah 46, verse 9. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And then listen, we switch now to the New Testament. Listen to what Jesus says regarding the same theme. And now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe. A moment ago, you heard Isaiah challenge, God speaking through the prophet Isaiah, that these things were spoken, that you would come to that place of belief, that you would understand that. And then we see Jesus in the New Testament echoing that same attribute. Father, we pray this morning that as we open up your word, I pray, God, that you'd stop the clock. I pray that you'd open up our hearts. And Father, that we would be students of your word. So God, we give you this time. We pray now in Jesus' name. And again, all God's people said, amen. amen. You can be seated. And as you are, church, the Bible uh, speaks to us and says of itself that it is powerful. The Bible says that of itself it is sharper than any two-edged sword, that the scriptures, the Bible has the ability to get inside of you and even divide up the very motive or the intent that is in your heart, so says the scriptures. God's word is given to us to give us light, to give us understanding. I always, I love saying this, by the way. It, it, it's, you know, we, we get impressed with New York best-selling books. The, the best-selling book, New York Times, and ooh, best-selling book. Do you know that every, they never report this actually, honestly, every year. The number one best-selling book of all time every year has been the Bible. 
has been the Bible. It appears it's always going to be the Bible. And uh, why is that true? Because the Bible tells us in Psalms 107, and I love this passage, Psalm 107 verse 20 says, he sent his word and healed them. Think of the power of God's word. And delivered them from their destructions. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. God sends forth his word and it brings healing. And maybe you need that today. We all need that in some way, shape, or form. God's word is powerful. We're going to be looking at the power of God's word today, what it means to us in the time in which we're living. But if you step back with me 2,000 years ago, you think about this for a moment. There's a man by the name of Saul, Saul of Tarsus. He's a Roman-born citizen, but he's, he's Hebrew, he's, he's Jewish. And he's a man that, according to the Bible, was extremely zealous against Christianity. Uh, even to this day, Paul the Apostle, earlier known as Saul of Tarsus, Paul still to this day is the greatest known convert to Christianity that the world has ever known. He knew the Old Testament scriptures, uh, unlike anybody. And the Bible says that concerning the uh, righteousness which is by the law, he was blameless. That concerning the fact that he was of the right stock, he was born a Hebrew of the tribe of Benjamin, that he had been circumcised on the eighth day, and concerning his equals, he was considered to be perfect. But all of a sudden, he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and his life was transformed. And that man went on to be the greatest voice for the cause of God's word. And what I love about Paul, and you got to remember this, church, 2,000 years ago, when Paul preached the gospel, more specifically, when he came to, as he was heading to Europe, he came to that area uh, of Asia Minor, which is uh, down near uh, west uh, toward Thessalonica, one of the oldest cities in the world still to this day. And when Paul got there, nobody was uh, believers. There was no church. But he went there, and there were synagogues. And he was a man of, of the synagogue. And so he went to the synagogue, and he opened up to them the scriptures for three weeks, the Bible tells us. Uh, by the way, he stayed there for three to four weeks. Check this out. He preached the gospel from the Old Testament. People were converted to what the Old Testament preached was that Messiah would come, and that when they began to believe, the Bible tells us a church was created, ecclesia, a gathering together. And from there, he moved on. Uh, but he taught them, church, mark this, he taught them two key doctrines. He was only there three to four weeks. Two key doctrines. One, your salvation is secure in Messiah, and number two is the fact that God knows everything. In fact, Christ is coming back. That's what he taught them. Your salvation secure. I love that. And oh, by the way, Christ is coming back. You put those two things together and you've got the ultimate motivation for the believer to go about this world and telling people about the hope that's available to them in Christ. That's all we need. We don't need a seminary. We don't need books. We don't need anything else. It's nice to have them if they're right. But we have the word of God. We have the message of God. And the Bible says we've got the power of the Holy Spirit to do that. And so Paul did that and began to transform the world. And it all comes down to the fact that I'm, I'm really, if you've been hanging out here for a few weeks, you're going to say, man, that guy quotes that verse like every week. And you're right, I do, because I'm really rubbing it in right now. And that is Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says this, church, listen. And let us consider one another in order to stir. The word in Greek is stimulate, provoke, challenge, to stir up love and good works. Keep your finger there. As believers, we are to be interfacing with one another to do two things in our lives. We are to stir each other up to love. You know, love's a, love is a verb. It, d love does stuff. Love's a verb. We're to love. That means we are to love one another. And we're to love those around us. That means you love those who sat in your seat today. How'd they get your seat? You're going to love them. You're not going to ask them about that or tell them that's my seat. That's not your seat, by the way. You didn't buy that seat. That's not your seat. Oh, no, that's my parking spot. Not your parking spot. Because we're going to stir one another up to love. We're going to yield our seat to them. And we're going to yield our parking spot to them. 
And why? Because we are to love. That's what we're to be doing. As a church, we are to love. And then the Bible tells us that we are to stir up these good works, meaning that our activity is this. We need to get together. Listen, I'm going somewhere with this. Know one another enough to say, hey, you know what? We're, we're fellow believers. We go to the same church. Let's go, let's go shake the world up for God. Let's go do something. Let's go do something. Let's go park. Let's go to the hospital and just stand out there and pray for people. Let's go to the local uh, abortion clinic and pray outside and pray, pray for hope, pray for salvation. Let's go to somebody that's shut in. Let's paint somebody's fence or let's take somebody's trash out. And listen, the early Roman Empire said, Caesar even confessed, these Christians, they love one another. But that's not all that that passage says. It says that we are to, verse 25, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. That means we are supposed to be doing church. But listen, he says, don't forsake the assembling of ourselves together as, listen, the manner of some have done. That's sad. They've given up on assembling. But the Bible tells us, but exhort one another and so much more as you see the day approaching. 21st century, right here, right now, the Bible commands us, whatever you do, you need to stir each other up to love, do good things, good deeds, blessing other people, and oh, by the way, as a church, never stop meeting, never stop meeting, but, but, but Paul didn't know about COVID, never stop meeting, <laughs> World War I, never stop meeting, World War II, never stop meeting, listen, World War III, we don't know where it's going to happen, what, where it's going to don't stop meeting. Listen, the church all around the world meets every city. You see, Pastor, but the health department. Listen, God knows about the health department. You must understand something. The Bible says, do not forsake the assembling together. And there's no little, read the fine print. Why? Because more than ever, the, the world around us needs the love and the activity of the church. We are not a company. We're not a corporation. We are the church of the living God, and that's what we are to do. We are to love and express that love to everyone we meet. Why? Why? What's the big motive? Because the motive, listen, we understand clearly from Scripture, Christ Jesus could come back at any time. The imminent doctrine of Christ is that he comes back for the church, and it could happen at any time. That's a tremendous statement. How many of you have been to Maui? Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever driven, listen, right, right off of the uh, main boulevard, when you go downtown to Lahaina, you've got to go past this church. And I've never been to this church. I've only looked at it and loved their sign. When we say Jesus is coming back, apparently this church is so hot on that doctrine that they, draw, they, don't, even, they don't even lengthen the statement, Jesus is coming. They just say, Jesus, coming soon. Have you ever seen that? Coming soon. <laughs> Jurassic Park, or whatever it is. Listen, you say, I don't understand this, Pastor. How does this uh, equate to my life? Listen, because Jesus Christ is coming soon. In fact, there's another picture of this, I think, somewhere. Or did we already show that one? Um, we saw the, the two of them. Um, I just want to make sure you've got the front and the back. <laughs> they got it coming and going. And as believers, that's how we're supposed to be. Everything that about our lives, we are to live. Yeah, do we, go, do we go to college or do we become doctors or do we become engineers or do we raise up a family? Yes, yes, we occupy till the Lord comes. But the fact of the matter is we want to tell as many people about Jesus Christ as possible because he's coming back. And even if he doesn't come back in the next few hours, you and I could see him. You never know when you're going to choke on that breakfast burrito or... <laughs> Our, our trip over a, a banana peel. You need to be ready to meet the Lord. And so Paul the Apostle encouraged the church, for example, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, he says, knowing, beloved brethren, your election by God. In other words, God called you out of this world. For our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance as you know what kind of men we were among you for your sake. Paul lived godly and he preached a godly message. Verse 8, same chapter says, For you, or from you, the word of the Lord has sounded forth. I love that. That's true about you guys too, by the way. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place, your faith toward God has gone out. What an active church they were, Thessalonians. And listen, they were Gentiles. Paul was a Jew, and he came and he preached 
and ignited that Gentile city, that pagan Gentile city. Verse 10, same chapter. We are to wait and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Bible students, you should mark the word wrath. Don't misinterpret this verse. The word wrath, the wrath, is specific. A definite article, the wrath. There is a wrath coming according to the Bible. It's found in the Old and New Testament alike. And they all, all passages and statements agree on this, that the wrath is the wrath of Almighty God. This has nothing to do with hell. You say, well, I read that verse. Yeah, sure, Jesus delivered us from hell. He certainly did that, but that's not what the verse means. It means that there's a day coming when this world will be punished for its unbelief against God. And that time is well defined in Scripture. The Bible here tells us that for those who are trusting Christ, there's an urgency within us to be waiting for the return of Christ. And it's exciting for us because the Bible tells us he's going to deliver us from the wrath that is going to be poured out upon this world. That age, it's known as the seven-year tribulation period or what is known as the 70th week of Daniel, chapter 9, book of Daniel. And it's a time when God announces, I now specifically deal with Israel, my people, to bring them back into their land and to pour out my spirit upon them, he says, while I pour out my wrath upon the earth. Remarkable. A time that you'll see by the end of this message is different than the church age. And so church, as we look at this, get ready to take some notes. Are you ready? No, you're not. Believe me. We're, we have so many verses, and we're going to go so fast. Up until now, I've gone slow with you for these last 30 years. We're going to go fast right now. Regarding approaching and the theme of that, number one, mark it down. Approaching, notice, is the times of the signs. There's quiet in here because you think I spelled that wrong. Normally, it said, well, are we living in the signs, uh, the, the signs of the times? Yeah, but what I would like to say to you is we're living in the times of the signs. In other words, there are things happening on the world scene right now in this 21st century that have never happened before, but they had to happen biblically, and those passages of Scripture have been waiting for us to meet up with them for millennia. You and I are living in a very, very interesting time regarding nations, regarding cultures, regarding what's happening in the world. It's, it's not an accident that you're alive and breathing at this moment. It's not an accident that you're here right now or that you're tuning in right now. God knows exactly what he's doing. But I'm going to suggest to you today that we're living the times of signs. Now look, we are not sensationalist, meaning, oh, that's a Bible prophecy, and oh, that's a Bible prophecy, and look, that's a Bible prophecy. No, we're not doing that. That's hyper. That's strange. But on the other side, we're not deniers either. We're not saying, oh, God's prophetic word is not prophetic at all. It's just simply allegorical. Oh, no, it's not. No, you know what? We are, how about this? We're stage setters. We are watching the world scene be set up in such a way that it's got to get our attention. And again, from Genesis to Revelation, God's word is spoken favorably toward all those who are watching and waiting through the word of God in their daily life. Every single one of them. It's remarkable. So as we look around at the world scene, we, we consider about the signs of the times and the times of the signs. We see a stage set and there's props being put up. There's placards being put in place. Lighting is being moved in. There, is, there are players, national players. There are, there are uh, key trends and decisions being made in the world today. The movement toward a world... Uh, Government, the movement toward a world uh, health program, the talk right now of an international, global uh, reset regarding vaccinations or economies, all being talked about. These are the opening throws. We're living in amazing days. Now listen to this. You might say today, I don't need to know this stuff. Be careful. It's in the Bible. 27 to 31% of it's in here for a reason. Number one, listen, Matthew chapter 24, verse 1. Matthew 24, verse 1. The Bible says, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple. He had been teaching there earlier, if you read the previous chapters. And his disciples came up to him to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? 
Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left upon another that shall not be thrown down. Church, that's it. If you're Jewish and you're the disciples and you're standing there looking at one of the wonders of the world and they're, they're saying, Jesus, isn't it amazing? This is where we meet God. And Jesus says, take a good look because it's all going to come down. Now, they didn't like what he said. But in the year 70 AD, under General Titus, it all came down. Not one stone was left upon another. Verse 3. Now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, or asking three questions. Tell us, when will these things be? Number two, what will be the sign of your coming? And three, of the end of the world, or the end of the age. And Jesus said to them, now you listen to this. Jesus said to them, indicators, signs. Uh, listen, I have an awesome antique barometer at home. It's beautiful. It's from the late 1800s. It's spectacular. And it works perfectly. All the weather that we've been having lately, can you believe we had weather? In California, it rained. We saw clouds. What are those things? And then it rained. And then in some areas, it snowed down to 1,000 feet. We had lightning and thunder. My mom used to tell me growing up, because she was born and raised in Hawaii, and she, this is what they were told, that's what told her, is that when you see lightning, that's the scoreboard of heaven. And thunder is the angels bowling. Look, I don't think there's bowling in heaven, our scoreboards, but when I saw that, those big flashes of light, I thought, man, that's, that's amazing. And I remembered my mom's voice. Well, listen, the fact of the matter is, when the Bible tells us that these things are coming, there's indicators. The storm came. The barometer dropped dramatically. We knew something was up because the barometer fell so greatly before there was ever a cloud in the sky. Indicators. And you keep that in mind right now, because listen, in verse 4 of Matthew 24, Jesus said to them, take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am Messiah, or Christ, and will deceive many. Jesus said, here's an indicator. And by the way, if you're not a believer, listen up. This is awesome. Jesus said, as you get deeper into the end time events, these are some of the things that you'll see. These are some of the things that will indicate the times of the signs, or the signs of the times. It's the fact that there'll be great deceivers in a religious or spiritual context pulling people away, not only from the word of God, but there will be false messiahs that will rise up. Jesus said that, church, 2,000 years ago. Remarkable. Next, verse 6, chapter 24, and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Wars and rumors of wars. Constantly growing. Verse 7. He says, For nation will rise against nation. Those of you who are Bible students, you should mark this right now. The word nation is the word uh, ethnos in Greek. Jesus said ethnos will rise up against, warring against ethnos. It's where we get the word ethnicity or ethnic groups. Jesus said one of the indicators of the last days is that ethnicities will divide from one another and they will war against each other. You know what? Not only is that happening, but the world that you and I live in, it's stoking the flames of that. It's, oh, it's as though we are hell-bent on a course to destroy ourselves as a culture. And of course we are. A culture without God is a destructive culture. But it's amazing to me that the news media, the print media, radio, songs, movies, stoking the angst that whites should hate blacks, blacks should hate Hispanics, reds versus Fill in the blank. Remarkable. You guys know by now, I don't hold anything from you, so I'll probably get in trouble about this when I get home, but <laughs> this morning I was getting ready to come here, and uh, clearly, by, the, by our bathtub, our granddaughter on Saturday had used our bathtub. How do I know? Because there are a bunch of toys left in the bathtub. And um, it made me think, because I knew, I knew this verse. I had this verse here in my notes a few days ago, but I looked at what I saw in the bathtub. Do you know what I saw in the bathtub? I saw teacups, I saw little chairs and little tables, <laughs> and I saw little combs, and I saw a white Barbie. I saw what is either a Hispanic or Polynesian Barbie, and I saw a black Barbie. Um, and how do you know? They're all naked <laughs> in the bathtub, 
And it blessed my heart because I thought, you know what's so cool about that? My granddaughter, she has no knowledge that this one's white, that this one's Polynesian or Hispanic, or this one's black. It was the United Nations in my bathtub right there. It was awesome. But Jesus said in the last days, you'll have an indicator. And the indicator will be ethnic groups will war against ethnic groups. You know why that's true? Because there's no Jesus in your heart. That's why that's true. When there's no Jesus in your heart, you parse yourselves up, you divide, you get into little cliques and groups, and God hates that. Hello? Take a picture. Go look at the book of Revelation. The Bible says in heaven, there are those from every kindred, tribe, tongue, and nations of the earth in heaven. That is awesome. So listen, if you're a racist or if you want to be like that, you're not going to enjoy heaven. You're not going to be happy there. Well, where's my section? <laughs> Can you imagine? They open up the door and there's flames and fire coming. Here's your section. <laughs> Look, the gospel asked you, you want smoking or non-smoking? It's right there. No, we need to be careful about that. But Jesus said, watch out. Racism is going to be on the great increase. It'd be one of the signs of the times. He said in verse 7, and kingdom will be against kingdom. Basilia against Basilia. These are politicals versus politicals. That's what we're most, more accustomed to when we think of nations, right? But it's kingdoms. Political rules will war against political rules, thus political wars. Verse 7 continues. This is amazing. He said, Jesus said, there'll be famines. There'll be pestilence and curable viruses and diseases. Earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. You say, it's going to get worse? He said, this is the beginning. See, glad you come to church today, right? Big encouragement. COVID was just warm up. <laughs> Think of it. I'm glad Jesus told me all this stuff. I'm glad that Isaiah told me this stuff. I'm glad Ezekiel told me what he said. When God tells us stuff in advance, it's called Bible prophecy. It should bring you comfort. It should really bring you comfort. Look, I want to know what's coming up. I mentioned it a few weeks ago, but I'll use it in a different context. This thing about... You know, why do I need to know this and why this and why that? Because we need to know where we're going and we need to know what's ahead. That's why God has given us his word. And the fact is that it's so simple to us. We just need to translate it over. When you and I are going down the road, and now our apps are so cool, they're telling us everything. I've got now an app like you probably do. By, by the way, it's created by the IDF. I don't know if you know this or not. Have you heard of the app Waze? It's, it was created by the IDF in Israel regarding Gaza. And, uh, but anyway, that's another story. Uh, but when you have Waze and you're driving along, and it says debris up ahead, three miles. It also says police officer, a mile ahead on the left. For you sinners. <laughs> but it tells you what's coming. Don't you appreciate that? Here's the app for life. This is it right here. It tells you what's coming up. It tells you what's next. And we need that. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, verse 25, Luke 21, 25, Jesus said regarding the end times, there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and on the earth distress among nations. Listen to this, with perplexity. The word, the word perplexity in Greek means nations will have no way out of dilemmas. There's no way out. The sea and the waves roaring. Now listen, think COVID right now. Think, listen. Men's hearts will fail them for fear. And the expectation of those things which are coming upon the earth, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Listen, I don't mean to belittle anything. But according to God's prophetic plan, COVID may not even appear on the radar. A blip at best. There are things coming to this Christ rejecting world that are cataclysmic. The world is, as it were, shaking. And there's almost a violence to it just in and of itself. But Jesus said there's a time coming when men's hearts will fail them for fear. They look around, they'll see the headline news and they'll begin to get palpitations, stress, and maybe heart attacks. Their hearts will fail them because of fear. And all around the world today, I'm, I'm, it's almost embarrassing to be a human right now. We, we, we buckled. 
I'm convinced that if we didn't have the media platforms that are available uh, to pound us with constant propaganda, we would have fared much better. But people are bound in fear. You see people crippled by fear. And this is just the beginning, Jesus said. See, what's your point? My point is, listen, Christ comes into your life. He takes away the fear of death. He gives you a reason to live. And listen, listen, if he can handle the grave and make it empty, he can take care of anything else that comes into your life. We need to stop fearing. It has crippled you if you think of it. Signs of the times. Number two is the witness of the scriptures. Approaching every day is the witness of the scriptures, the Bible. Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25 says, For I am the Lord, I speak. Oh, I love that. And the word which I speak will come to pass. It will no more be postponed. For in your days, O rebellious house, I will say the word and perform it, says the Lord God. I love what, listen, church, when God says something, listen, get your Bible. God said it. You can just, just wait for him to do it. If God said it, Stand on that. He cannot lie. He's holy. Think about it. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Imagine if Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were standing here today. You know what they would say? They would say, I read Genesis. I read Exodus. I read the first five books. He kept every word he promised. Even to this day, as God draws Israel back into its own land, could never have been said until May 14th, 1948. God said, I'm going to do it. And he's doing it. When God speaks to you out of his word, he's going to do it. The authority of the scripture, church, is absolutely undeniable and accurate. I boast in this. I rejoice in this. People say, well, you can't, do, you can't prove the existence of God. I believe I can. So you've got to be kidding. I am not kidding. Because when the Bible says something 1,000 years ago, and then here it is, when the Bible says something 3,000 years ago, and here it is, you can put that in the lab. You can test that. The validity of the Bible Remember now, Jesus said, I've told you these things in advance that when they happen, you will know and believe. Isaiah echoed the same. In fact, we read it a moment ago. Let's look at it again. Isaiah 42, verse 9. Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That's my God. He's that big. This is so cool. Isn't it kind of like how it is with parents and kids, though? Daddy, daddy, mommy, mommy, don't worry about it. We're going to go down there, and we're going to turn right, and then the thing's going to be there, and then we're going to walk in, and it's all good. And the kid goes, all right. <laughs> they don't know, but we know. We're kind of like a little god to them in a way. We take care of them. We feed them. They panic. Uh, we calm them down. They don't know the way. We take them the way. That's how they learn obedience, when they're just little things. Right? Think about it. That's why parenting is such a divine thing. But that's another Bible study some other day for that. <laughs> Scripture, Isaiah 45, verse 21 and 22. Isaiah 45, 21. Declare what is to be. Present it. And let them take counsel together. For who foretold this long ago? Who declared it from the distant past? Was it not I? The Lord, and there is listen, no God apart from me, a righteous God and Savior. That means there's one God, there's one Savior, people. That's, uh, there's not going to be two. There is none but me. Turn to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. When I see God flexing, that's how he flexes, right there. That's just, you can see God drop the microphone at that one. <laughs> all these idols have got to run away, if they could run. Isaiah 46, 9 and 10. We read it earlier today. For I am God. There is no other. I am God. There's none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. Okay, so listen. That's God speaking in the Old Testament. We read in our introduction, John 14, 29, but listen carefully. Hang on to your seats. John 14, 29, Jesus said, and now I have told you before it comes that when it does come to pass, you may believe, but the question is, what am I to believe? <laughs> well, I'm glad you asked, because Proverbs 30, verse 4, connects the prophetic nature of God and who you are to believe. Proverbs 30, verse 4, who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fist? Who has bound the waters in his garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? 
What is his name? And what is his son's name? If you know. And in my notes, the word if, I have highlighted. If. That's the key, isn't it? Isn't that all hinged for eternity? That if. Do you know when it says, what is his son's name if you know? Friends, if you don't know, this is Proverbs. This is the Old Testament. God is saying, what's my name? Oh, and what's the name of my son? If you know. Do you remember when you were a kid, little in school and you knew? You'd jump up out of your seat. Ooh, 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 ooh. Pick me, pick me. Remember that? Everybody in heaven are like that. They're, 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 kid, they're people like that. Ooh, I knew, I knew. When I lived on earth, I knew. Will you be able to say that? The prophet Isaiah announced that the Messiah would come by way of a virgin. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. That the very same one that would come born of a virgin, Isaiah 7, 14, would be the one who would govern the nations and he has always existed, Isaiah 9, 6. But those same Hebrew prophets also said that you'll find him born in Bethlehem, Micah chapter 5, verse 2. The Bible says in Psalm 2 that the nations would rage at God and his son. Wow. Remarkable. We look to the strength and the validity and the veracity of the scriptures. Number three, approaching, is the reason for faith. Always, every time we hear the Bible, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Christian, every time you hear a Bible verse or a sermon preached, your faith should grow because what's implied is that you're going to practice what you've just heard, right? Reasons for faith. By the way, faith uh, is conceived, the conception of faith happens when your questions get answered. People have questions, I think, that are put in us by God. What's the meaning of life? I think God put that in you to ask. Why am I here? What's the purpose of all of this? What happens when I die? People want answers. And the Bible makes it very, very clear. In 1 Peter 3, 15, we are to give them the answer. Did you know that? See, but I'm just a Christian. And you remember what the word Christian means. It means Christ follower. You're a follower. 1 Peter 3, 15 says, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. Isn't that cool? You and I are supposed to be answering people's questions. Ladies and gentlemen, do people have a lot of questions right now? People are terrified. We, it's not us, but we've been given the answer. We don't walk up and say, hey, I'm the answer. <laughs> no, we say, you know what? I have the answer. And this is a tremendous time to do that very, very thing. People need answers. By the way, again, with kids, when your little kid says, uh, daddy, do worms yawn? When they're, do they yawn? You say, I don't know, but let's go study worms. If your kid says, what's my birthday doing right now? Well, let's look at a calendar and see how far it is away. When kids ask those amazing, crazy little questions, you've got to answer them. Because if you don't answer your kid the question, listen, a kid growing up without answers is confused. And you know that's true in your own life. That's why we say, God, I have this question. Then get the answer. Here at this church, if you call the church, you say, I have so many questions. What we'll say is, well, we'll answer your questions from the Bible. We'd love for you to get the answers yourself from the Bible. But go ahead and read it and then call us back. But just know this. We're just going to point you to the Bible because the Bible's the answer. When somebody has the Bible as the answer, you can't shake that answer. Right. It's firm, it's steadfast, it's immovable. But you, listen, the questions have got to be answered. It's the way you're wired as a human. The Bible tells us that in Acts chapter 17, verse 2, this is, again, this is Paul's tactic, this is Paul's way. He, uh, he's in Greece now, but anyway, Acts 17, it says, then Paul, as his custom was, went into them, that is his Jewish brethren, his his uh, Jewish uh, brothers, 
for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the, what? Scriptures, and that's the Old Testament. I often tell you, church, be skilled at speaking as to why, listen, listen, please listen, why do you believe what the New Testament says? You should be challenged all the time on this. Why do you believe the New Testament? Oh, that's simple. Because the New Testament is simply the reporter's records of what was promised in the old. I would never know if what was spoken in the old was fulfilled unless the eyewitness accounts of the New Testament. That's what it's for. The Old Testament announced this, and the New Testament recorded it. That's how I know the New Testament's true, because I read the Old Testament. Are you with me? When Paul preached, he only had the Old Testament. He didn't say, turn to Romans. Whoops, I I haven't written that part yet. They didn't have it. And what did they do? They preached Christ. They preached crucifixion. They preached resurrection. They preached, listen, righteousness by faith, not by works. Faith before God in his ability to provide a sacrifice, beginning with Abraham and Isaac on Mount Moriah. All of it. Absolutely awesome. Faith. And we need to know that. And we need to practice that. Number four. Are we on number four, church? Anybody taking notes? Lost my place. Fourth. Approaching is a clear understanding. Oh, this is fun. A clear understanding. So where we are, uh, today uh, is the 14th. Yes? Today is the 14th of this month of this year. Guess what? We have never been this far before. We're in uncharted territory, folks. And yet you're not worried about it. How is that? You didn't go to bed last night. Oh, my goodness. And guess what? When you wake up tomorrow, we've never been there before. That's okay. God told us how it's going to go. Here's what's cool about this. I love books, and I have some really old books. And so when I'm reading these great saints of yesteryear, I have books that are two, three, four, five hundred-year-old authors. When you read guys who, for example, great scholars 500 years ago, when they look at Jesus' words about the temple or when they look at Daniel chapter 9, you should hear what they have to say. It makes no sense. You want to know why? They were so far back that they didn't see clearly up ahead. Time is linear, people, on a line. Think of it. Time begins and time ends. And you know what's cool about this? We know that that's true even in physics. Time's a... Time is a physical aspect of physics. You can tamper with time. It's weird. Time begins and time ends on a linear scale. And somewhere along the line, somebody lived and somebody wrote a book. And for their day, at their time, they had an understanding from their perspective. Now, those of us who live in the 21st century are way further down on that timeline with Bible open. For example, Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27, mark it down is the lock and key of understanding all Bible prophecy. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. If you don't read Daniel 9, 24 to 27, you'll never understand the book of Revelation. Ain't no way. Listen. It's from that, it's from those few verses of that book that it announces to us that Israel will come back into their own land. Israel will someday in the last days have a temple again. That the Messiah will come, but he's going to be killed, but not because he did anything wrong. It tells us that another one will come after they reject him, and they will accept an imposter. It's Daniel 9, 24 to 27 that tells us in the middle of the seven-year tribulation period, he breaks the treaty he makes with Israel. That's Old Testament doctrine, people. We understand that now because Israel is a nation again. The wheels are turning. And we're further down on that linear scale now toward the end. And it's an amazing time to be alive, church family. By the way, Daniel 9, 9, uh, Daniel chapter 12, verse 4 says this. Daniel 12, 4, listen to this, says, But you, O Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Watch this, scholars, because here comes a qualifying statement. Many shall run to and fro, and knowledge shall be increased. Translation, Daniel. What I just showed you, just lock it up. 
Just lock it up. You're not going to get it. People are not going to understand it. People won't be able to figure it out until we get closer to the end. Oh, by the way, Daniel, here's one of the clues, by the way, for people who will wind up reading this in the end. In English, it says men will travel to and fro. The Hebrew word is men will travel quickly and broadly, fast and far. Wow. And knowledge shall be increased, exponential. Knowledge here, then here, then here. And it's really cool because the more time goes by, the greater the doubling up of knowledge gets. Where'd you get that idea from? Bible. Remarkable. Greater understanding as we get further down the road. Who would have, for example, who would have ever thought that it'd be a good idea to zero out all the global economies and currencies and make it just one numerical system and make it cashless? Human trafficking is a problem. What are we going to do about that? How do we stop drug and how do, all the, how, what do we do? Remove, remove currencies and you'll end it all. It's brilliant. The Bible tells us that's how a false Messiah is going to come on the scene and deceive the world. Now we hear talk. In fact, I was talking to my uh, Israeli friends just this last week and Israel is considering now nobody, they're considering it. Maybe now no one coming to Israel without having an Israeli vaccination because they trust theirs and they don't trust ours. I get it. Listen, what if the whole world says, yeah, that's right, you can't come to Canada without a vaccine. And then Australia says, yeah, you can't come down under either. Well, what if the whole world says, you can't come, okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, that's not the mark of the beast. That's preparing people for it. Do you understand? Because there could be five other things that come down the road before that time ever comes. I'm getting down a road that we shouldn't go down right now. (laughs) We have clear understanding. Number five, approaching is the increasing darkness in our world. And I'm not talking about forgetting to change your clock this morning. (laughs) Some of you woke up in pitch black dark. You wonder what happened. Darkness. I'm talking about the moral decay and decadence and evil that is rampant in our world today. You say, yeah, it's always been bad. Listen, not only has it not been this bad, I equate the times that we're living in, it sounds like they're almost similar to or equal with as it was in the days of Noah. Aberrant sexuality, violence. The Bible says there was violence continually. Remember, Jesus said it's going to get worse as we approach those times. Increasing darkness. I'm sorry to pain you on this beautiful morning, but we won't be here long on this. I am dumbfounded, stupefied of this world's unwillingness to address evil. You you pick the topic... And those that are supposed to be gatekeepers of truth turn a blind eye. If it's dialing 911 to the Supreme Court to a parent, turn a blind eye. Shocking. Increasing darkness where there's this absolute unified determination to suppress good. The things that, listen, the things that we're fighting just this church, we're just a little nothing. We're not even a blip on the radar. You think about it. The things that we have to fight to keep our messages online these days now. The enemy is the social media czars. Why? Because when you don't have a real message of your own, you're terrified by truth. John Adams said, truth or facts are stubborn things. And when you can't cope with facts, you have to make things up. And listen, please, I hope all of you learned this last week and a half. Well, I'm going to fact check that. (laughs) Now we know who owns the fact checking apps. Hello? Now, oh, Franklin Graham prays a prayer. And the fact checkers said, we fact checked his prayer. It's not correct. That's not what God meant when he said that. Can you believe this? Listen. 
You don't know what's true unless it's in the Bible. And I, if you can get a good book by a dead guy, then read it. Because if it's a good book by a living guy, I'm a little bit nervous because he's still alive. He could change his mind. <laughs> the Bible's not changing. Isaiah 5 verse 20 says, What sorrow awaits those who say that evil is good and good is evil? That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. What sorrow awaits those who are wise in their own eyes and think themselves so clever? Number six, we'll end with this. I'm saying we're ending with this. We're not ending, but we're ending with this. Because you need to know that. Is the greater hope. Approaching is the greater hope. Church family, Titus 2.13, a verse I often quote because it's one of my life verses. It's undeniable. It says, looking for the blessed hope. The word looking here is in the active present. It means that we are, as believers, we are to be doing our jobs, living our lives, being who we are, doing what God has called us to do, and the whole time we're doing it, we are looking for the blessed hope. What does that mean? We're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, says the Bible. Wow. Any time now, any moment now, any moment. Any time. Because remember, he can come for us at any time. So we're going to run through some things. Hang on. In the doctrine of eschatology within the study of theology, People who are lazy, I believe, in my opinion, lazy and pre-formulated by others can approach the Bible with a bias. And you can come out saying that this is how I view it rather than letting the Bible speak to you. Just let it talk to you. You must understand, church, that God calls the bride of Christ, the church in the Bible, a mystery. He never says that Israel is a mystery. Did you know that? He calls Israel his people, his nation. Are you with me? The Bible draws a clear distinction between the church, which is predominantly Gentile, and Israel. There is no national judgment or anything like that regarding the church. There's only, only individual judgment for the church or Uh, scrutiny of Christ, but there is national judgment for the nation of Israel. This is important to know because when it comes to the rapture and the second coming, there's a great difference. And a lot of people today are saying that there's no difference. And frankly, that comes from lazy theology. So we can't fix the world in five minutes, but we're going to try. Are you ready? Get ready. Know the difference. Know the difference. Number one, let's look at this on the screen. The greater hope is this. So A will equal church, B will equal Israel. Number one, number one A. At the rapture, Jesus appears in the atmosphere to receive his church only. In the second coming, Jesus returns to Israel with his church. These are lifted right from passages of scripture. Number two. At the rapture, all church age believers go up to meet Christ. At the second coming, all church age believers come down with Christ. Number three, at the rapture, Christians are taken to the Father's house, Jesus said. At the second coming, Christians return from the Father's house, Revelation 19. Number four, at the rapture, there is no judgment on earth. At the second coming, Christ comes to judge all the nations of the earth. Number five, at the rapture, only the church sees and hears Christ appearing. At the second coming, unbelievers will see and hear Christ returning. Number six, at the rapture, the timing is imminent and sudden. At the second coming, the timing is chronological and sequential. Seven, at the rapture, there are no prerequisite events or signs required. At the second coming, multiple prerequisites and signs are required. Eight, at the rapture, the church is the focal point. At the second coming, Israel 
is the focal point. Nine, at the rapture, there is great joy and comfort. At the second coming, there is great weeping and sorrow. Ten, at the rapture, all believers are suddenly changed. At the second coming, no believers are suddenly changed. Eleven, at the rapture, there is no mention of Satan being bound. At the second coming, Satan is bound for a thousand years, and all God's people said, Amen. At the rapture, God's promise to deliver the church from uh, his wrath is fulfilled. At the second coming, God's promised wrath is fulfilled. Thirteen. The church is taken up to heaven in the rapture and, and judged at the Bema seat. That's the Olympic seat, a gold, silver, bronze in heaven. That's the word Bema. That's where it comes from, from the Olympics of, his, of uh, first century. At the second coming, all nations are judged at Jerusalem. The Bible says it has to happen in Jerusalem, according to the book of Joel and Zechariah. No, uh, number 14, at the rapture, the seven-year tribulation period begins. At the second coming, the seven-year tribulation period ends. Fifteen, at the rapture, there is no marriage feast of the Lamb in heaven. At the second coming, there is marriage uh, feast of the Lamb on earth. That is debated by some scholars. I commend you to Dr. John Wolvert on that. It's an amazing study. What's the point? The point is that there's a difference. This is the first time, listen, are you sitting down? This is huge, what I'm about to say. Since 1948, this is the first time the church and Israel has coexisted for the first time in history. That's how close we are. Because God is just about ready to put his eyes back on Israel. That's a remarkable thing. Church, these are important things. and These are just a fraction of things that are significant that you should get excited about regarding Christ and his imminent return. Then seven, we end with this. We end with this in the seventh argument regarding approaching is the one moment that matters the most. So, okay, whatever, this is great. No, but hey, here's the thing. The Bible tells us that when you and I hear the gospel, we are to respond to it. No matter what I've said prior to this moment, this now becomes the most important thing and the most important thing said. The Bible says that Jesus Christ, according to the Old Testament scriptures, came, born of a virgin, died on a cross for our sins, and rose again from the dead, and left an empty tomb in Jerusalem, having been resurrected from the dead by his sacrifice, by his offering, his Passover, our sins are forgiven. And the Bible says, Jesus Christ said himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man can come from the Father but through man. He's the only way. This is the most important thing. That you cannot save yourself. You cannot be good enough. The moment you find out how amazing God is, you realize how wretched you are. That's why God gave us the Ten Commandments, because they're perfect and holy and pure. And when we wake up to the value of them, we realize we broke the first one. <laughs> Well, how many do you need to break before you... Look, poor Moses. Moses comes down the mountain. <laughs> Moses is carrying the Ten Commandments down the mountain. And poor Joshua, he's standing there waiting. Can you imagine? Looks in the sundial. It's been forever. <laughs> Moses comes down and Joshua says, listen, the people are rejoicing. And Moses says, they're not rejoicing. They're having an orgy. And Moses throws down the Ten Commandments and then tells them, you people broke these. Think about it. They did. They were breaking it before God probably put his finger in the stone. And it's true for all of us. We wake up to the realization that we're sick. We find out we have cancer. We find out that we've got leukemia. We find out that we've got a problem after we have it. God's word says... All of us are S-I-N positive. <laughs> and he says, but I took care of that. If you come to me, I will remove your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. The most important thing of these last days, and church, I'm going to leave this with you, is for us to give people the gospel. Listen, people are mortified. People are terrified right now. You, see, you hear what's going on in Texas? The governor opened up the state of Texas. So watch this. And a bunch of other governors followed, followed his lead. Here's the deal. 
Did you see? Uh, the governor's going to be sued, and so is the state of Texas. By Texans. I'm going to get mail for this. I shouldn't have called them Texans. They're probably a bunch of Californians who moved to Texas. <laughs> We're sorry. Sorry. But they're suing, they're, they're going to sue the governor, or they're threatening to sue the governor because uh, they don't want to stop wearing masks. Look, first of all, it's a free country. You want to wear a mask? Wear a mask. No, no, listen, it's okay. Listen, here's the deal. I'm going somewhere with this. Mask, no mask, I don't care. Listen, here's the thing. Even when it's okay to not wear a mask, people want to wear a mask. Why? But why do they want to wear a mask? Because they're, they're fearful. They're scared. I don't want to get it. Listen, this, this is your assignment this week. Every one of us, when you go out into the world, look, if, if you should wear a mask, wear a mask. Amen. I'm dead serious. But here's the thing. When you see someone, remember, you're supposed to answer their questions with respect and kindness. You can go up to somebody and say, I see you're wearing a mask. Are you okay? How are you? <laughs> I'm fine. I'm, I'm fine. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. Listen. I know that a lot of people are scared. A lot of people are fearful, and fear has clearly crippled families and our culture. Listen, friend, I want to pray for you, but I want you to know something. I, I'm a Christian. I'll just confess that straight up. I'm a Christian, and I was at church last Sunday, and the pastor said something about a person wears a mask so that they don't get sick. That they believe that the mask is going to stop the virus. And so here's the thing. Jesus Christ, he came to stop the virus of sin in our lives. Jesus hung on the cross to die for our sins and then being resurrected to impart his righteousness to us. That, friend, I understand the fear part of it. But the greater fear is where are you going to go if you die? Where are you going? Listen, you shouldn't be so afraid of being sick here. Your great fear should be sick in eternity. Amen. Jesus said, I am the phys physician. I have come to heal those that are sick. Amen. Father, we thank you for your truth and for your word. And Lord, it all comes down to us being confronted truly with your your Bible, and our feelings. Adams was right. Facts are stubborn things. Ben Shapiro's right. F truth doesn't care about our feelings. <laughs> well, that's true. But we do rejoice this morning that the way and the truth and the life is a person who ministers and loves who forgives prostitutes and bank robbers and malefactors and corporate liars and marital cheaters and the whole lot. And today, Father God, I pray that decisions would be made to follow Jesus, to do what Isaiah said, that all those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Lord, we do know the answer. Who's the one that holds the wind in his fist in the hollows of the seas and the hem of his robe? What is your name? And what is your son's name? If you know. It's Yeshua. It's Jesus. And we thank you that our salvation is not tied up in some ritual or fixed in some icon. But Christ lives. And because he lives, we live also. Well, hey, thanks for listening. And uh, we appreciate you. And of course we do in this time and in this age. Us being together and linking up together to get the word of God out is actually ministry being fulfilled. 
And in fact, if you would like to subscribe, please do so. Hit the subscribe button, tell your friends about us. And listen, if you'd like to help us get this out on a broader scale, you can support us by hitting on the Give Now button. And look, we're gonna continue on with or without you. We're inviting you to join us, no pressure. But if you'd like to link arms in this venture, you'd be greatly appreciated. So listen, keep praying for us, we're praying for you. God bless you, and we'll see you back here real soon.